Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our Candrium Academy talk on private assets and ESG. My name is Renato Guerriero. I am deputy CEO at Candrium, and I will have the pleasure to moderate this event. Both topics of ESG and private assets are very hot in the asset management industry and are very high on the agenda of many investors. So we thought it could be a great opportunity to share with you our thoughts about ESG and private assets. During the next hour, we will cover five topics. The first one is what does ESG mean for private assets and do ESG approaches vary across asset classes? How large is the market and what kind of investors dominate it? The third topic will be what are the challenges for investors in terms of methodology and data? The fourth one is the drivers for future growth. And last but not least, the impact of regulation. To cover all of these topics, I welcome our two very distinguished panelists. Claire de Roborel Clemence, Global Head of Private and Alternative Investments at BNP Paribas Wealth Management, and So Jin Kim, Head of ESG Research at Prequin. Let me introduce them a little bit more in detail. Claire spent her 30 years career in the private asset space. She joined BNP Paribas Wealth Management almost 20 years ago, setting up the private equity group and holding numerous management positions in the bank's wealth management division dedicated to private assets. Claire is also a member of various advisory boards of global and European private equity and real estate funds. Welcome, Claire. And so Jean heads the global ESG research operation at Prequin, the leading data provider for all alternatives data. So Jean is responsible for scaling the ESG data suite in line with industry standards and best practices. Engaging with internal stakeholders and external market leaders to inform and shape the company's products, policies, and strategic goals. So welcome both of you and thanks for accepting our invitation. Before I start, let me tell you that you have the possibility to ask your questions during this event uh, through the dedicated toolbox. Please send them uh, at any time and I will try to integrate them in the discussion or at the end of the webinar. So let us start with the first topic. What does ESG mean for private assets and do ESG approaches vary across private market asset classes? So Claire, I will start with you. Uh, you are on the buy side. Can you describe what you have seen in terms of offering and the features of ESG private assets that have been presented to you? And uh, really it's an open question. Please describe the evolution of the market. If you have seen an acceleration, I'm really keen to hear about your insights. Thank you Renato and uh, hello everyone. Maybe as an introduction, uh, BNP Paribas Wealth Management was a pioneer in giving its uh, clients access to private equity funds as we started uh, this offering in 98. Uh, today, we advise our clients in Europe, Asia, and Middle East to diversify their financial portfolio in each private uh, market asset class, i.e. private equity, private real estate, private credit, and private infrastructure. And our experts can guide them in an appropriate way, depending on the risk return profile of the portfolio that our clients target. And we have regularly carried out innovations to democratize our private equity offering. But that being said, to answer your question related to ESG features, uh, that's true that being uh, personally in the private assets uh, industry since uh, 25 years, I've seen the evolution within the private uh, assets managers 
and also uh, the private clients demand. Um, and BNP Paribas Wealth Management, of course, has developed a real expertise in sustainable and responsible investments since 2006. But as far as the private assets market is concerned, the industry is still in its early stage. Uh, I would say that awareness of ESG considerations has recently strongly increased among the private assets managers over the last years. And this is mainly due to the increasing demand from the institutional investors and, and first the pension funds and insurance companies, but also the private clients. Um, today, we see that uh, many GPs based in Europe, but also in the, in the US are, have signed, for example, the United Nations uh, principles for responsible investments, which was not the case 10 years ago. Uh, and in addition, the regulation has also accelerated the, the, the process. From a private investor's perspective uh, at wealth management, we, we've seen an increasing demand from clients for ESG integration and impact funds. And uh, I have also the feeling that the pandemic has accelerated this trend. Uh, and currently, we see an increasing interest from our clients to give meaning uh, to their wealth. But there is some confusion about the definitions. <laughs> um, because we speak about sustainable investing, which is a general approach to invest in a responsible way. We speak about ESG integration, which is a practice of investing. And we speak about impact investing, which is above ESG integration. And the key words to define the impact are intentionality, measurement, and additionality. And of course, the objectives of these funds linked to the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals defined by the United Nations. So, so there is clearly an evolution, but it's important to define what we are talking about and to differentiate also ESG products and impact funds. And maybe with, with Sujin and, and our study, we will have more, more information about that. Well, th thank you for, for your description of the market. And it's really impressive to notice you already back in 2006, you have developed uh, an approach to sustainability uh, within your bank. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the breakdown in terms of type of investments is, of course, very, very useful. Um, in terms of the different asset classes in private assets, have you noticed some different levels of maturity? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, infrastructure is, is maybe the most well advanced uh, as the investment strategy targets essential services to the community, which integrate by nature ESG factors. Uh, this is the case, for example, when they invest in energy transition or social infrastructure deals. Um, therefore, for infra, we could say that ESG approach is, some, is sometimes part of, of their DNA. For private equity, the maturity is growing uh, and my guess is that ESG integration will become uh, mainstream. Uh, even if we see some, some studies, uh, which show that only 25% of the private equity firms have a dedicated ESG team. So there is still some, some progress to, to do. Regarding real estate, uh, real estate is by nature on every ESG agenda as real estate is focusing on climate change mitigation with green buildings and decarbonization targets. Uh, but uh, I have the feeling that today the industry is, is more worried about the rising interest rates and, and worsening economic outlook. And ESG management is a long-term effort. And today it could be more difficult for the companies uh, who were not so active in ESG to start today, uh, as ESG is maybe not their first priority. But for the others, having started to implement an ESG policy, they, they continue, of course. And uh, it should be noted that for, for real estate, 
there is more and more pressure from the tenants to mitigate carbon emissions. And compared to the, the private equity, the real estate funds are more focused on the, the E and also the S or the accessibility of the buildings, for example. So yeah, we see a different uh, maturity between the, the asset classes. Yeah, absolutely, I fully agree with you that in some cases it's easier than others, but um, it's good to see we are making, making progress. Maybe one, one last uh, question I wanted to ask you is, uh, um, you know, in terms of the market and uh, how it is evolving, the products available, have you seen any, any change over time, over the last few years compared to back in 2006 or back in 1998 when you, when you started? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, Renato, I have a question for you. Do you know what is the main barrier for a private equity firm to um, ESG integration? In fact, this is a cost consideration. It's not an issue of, uh, of conviction. It, it, it's mainly a cost consideration. But today, ESG integration is no more an option. And, and I would say that 100% of the private assets fund we look at today uh, have an ESG focus, more or less developed, but they have an ESG focus. focus. So, um, uh, so this is what, what we see today. And in parallel, we see also an explosion of impact fund launches, which is quite recent. Huh? So, and alongside the newcomers, we see also more seasoned in managers um, who have also started to raise capital for impact funds uh, as they see that there is a, an investor appetite. And among these uh, impact funds, we see uh, specialized funds in various forms from deep expertise in specific geographical uh, markets or a focus on certain uh, impact themes such as energy transition, education, healthcare or, or social uh, inclusion. So yeah, we, we see an increasing number of uh, funds integrating ESG or having an impact strategies. We see more and more. Yeah. It's, thank you for, for your examples. It really shows the market is flourishing yeah. uh, with a lot of uh, new teams and, uh, and, and really the fact that we see this going into the subsectors, subcategories, geography shows that uh, there is a, an offer that is ready to capture the demand. Maybe let us now go to uh, Sujin because Sujin, I know you study this every day. So how does your, how do your notes compare and contrast with uh, what Claire has uh, described? Absolutely. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, perhaps I'll do a little bit of a quick intro about Prequin. So um, as Renato mentioned, we cover the entire alternative space. So when we're thinking everything from fundraising performance um, to the deal level and cash flows, um, we're tracking everything um, across all regions, across all asset classes. Um, and uh, our uh, business was started in 2003. However, our ESG products are fairly new. We launched our first product in 2020. And since then, uh, we have uh, grown to be a team of over 30 researchers. So uh, I, I definitely am very fortunate to be able to analyze things from uh, a kind of a bird's eye view. And uh, when I compare some of my notes that I took, um, I completely uh, agree with Claire across a, a lot of the sentiments that she mentioned. Um, I, I would say probably the three key ones are um, there is an acceleration in the market for ESG, particularly since COVID. I think uh, really the pandemic has brought an increased focus to how we're focusing particularly on E, um, as Claire mentioned, I think that usually takes the center stage. Um, however, a lot of people are still interested in incorporating SNG. Um, I think with a lot of the bank collapses that we've been hearing about the news, um, and also um, especially since the uh, George Floyd tragedy in the United States, SNG have been part of the conversation, um, but of course climate change is um, usually the the top of everyone's uh, list when you think of you know top risks for the world uh, world economic forum year over year um, 
it's it's usually climate change. So uh, those are definitely things that we'll touch upon later, especially in the regulatory section. Um, and and with that comes a lot of uh, resourcing costs and uh, also, also knowledge gaps. It's it's really difficult for a lot of firms to find talent that have the level of expertise for a field that is new, but also constantly growing. So we've seen a lot of um, ever evolving definitions in this space. I think that is an additional barrier that makes it increasingly difficult for a lot of managers to keep up with the reporting cycles as we try to integrate it into regular financial reporting. Um, in terms of the differences between asset classes, um, again, a lot of alignment with what Claire mentioned. I think infrastructure um, has a lot more built into its DNA, uh, which we'll get to actually in the next question. I have some fun slides to share for the group. Um, but with that, uh, you find things like renewable energy, which um, makes up uh, a really large chunk. I think uh, energy, traditional and renewable, makes up about 80% of the infrastructure space. So we're really seeing a, a large dominant uh, foundation of things that are already wholeheartedly uh, integrated with things like ESG integration, thematic investing, best in class, uh, value-based, um, all of the kind of core ESG themes. Um, that being said, I I still think there is a lot of work to be done. Um, one thing that I want to highlight is that we are talking about ESG specifically in private markets. Um, in this financial sector, there's a lot of capital and there is um, an inherent assumption of engagement with your portfolio companies in a way that public sectors, uh, fixed income, ETFs, uh, there's not really a lot of uh, one-to-one -one engagement with those companies in the same way that this market is. So I want to put a large emphasis that this market is very well positioned to make a difference. However, there is a lot that needs to be clarified for um, how we're going to start reporting on that, which is where all of the new regulations are, are really going to be very beneficial for our future. But I'll stop there. I, I think bottom line is uh, there's a lot of alignment with Claire and I's thinking. I think a lot of people in the ESG space um, are usually on the same page about a lot of the issues that we're all facing. So it's nice to have an open and honest conversation about those types of things. Uh, private markets is a little more uh, new to ESG than I think public markets are. Uh, public markets got about 10 to 15 years um, of maturity above us. So uh, we, we can definitely benefit from people like Claire in the space who have just had the tenure and the experience um, for private markets, which I would still say is getting out of the early stages of ESG, a little bit of growing pains there um, starting from the pandemic. But I, I think we're really starting to see um, some best in class, best practices emerge from this. Hey, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sergin. Um, we have a, a question from the audience. Um, the person is asking uh, to give some feedback on private debt or private credit in general on an ESG. If you have seen something that you I would like to share with the audience. Of course, I know there's, uh, you know, impact funds in private debt, or you know, there's been also um, an offering in in private debt. Uh, any any comments? Shall we start with you, Claire? Would you like to to share some feedback on private debt and ESG? Yeah, yeah. Um, on private credit, um, we see some funds having a, a focus on on ESG and in particular, which is qu quite new and still quite limited is the fact that they, they have some, co some covenants linked to uh, ESG achievements by, by the yeah. company, uh, which is uh, very innovative. Um, so there, there is also, uh, yeah, for sure there, there is, but maybe the, this is an asset class where it is less mature, but I don't know, Sujin, if you have a, a view on that. Sure. Um, I, I would definitely agree there uh, is a large focus on G. Um, a little bit more creativity needs to be spun for the E and S angles for private debt um, across. And these are just frequent definitions of asset classes, but we track seven, which is private equity, venture capital, private debt, real estate, infrastructure, natural resources, and hedge funds. When it comes to the private debt and hedge fund spaces, um, I think they typically um, 
get a reputation of being the harder asset classes to integrate ESG into, um, only because with um, you know your traditional private equity, real estate, and infrastructure, there's a lot of, um, I think, intuitive and uh, well, this might be an American phrase, but low hanging fruit. So yeah. something that feels very obvious of like, uh, ah, of course, this is my type of investment. So it's very natural for me to, for real estate, look into their uh, water meters and the emissions when building any of the infrastructure for private equity. Um, you're seeing a, a lot of aligned strategies uh, like healthcare, which especially during the pandemic has uh, reached a, a new high, I think, in terms of uh, the attention that it's getting and uh, clean tech. So um, for private debt, I think there needs to be a lot of governance issues um, that are linked with that. Um, and we're seeing a, a lot of cases, I think, especially given everything that happened with Silicon Valley Bank recently, just an additional focus on governance. So um, I would say a lot of the times these large macro environments um, kind of uh, heed this external force that um, kind of presses different issues to the forefront. So um, for private debt, I would definitely say um, more of a governance lens, but uh, I definitely welcome any questions in the chat if, if we didn't answer your question. Thank you. Thank you both, Claire and Sojin. I think um, there's there's more questions that are coming in, and we'll try to put them into uh, into the uh, into the structure of the panel. So I would like to go now on the second uh, topic of the panel, that is uh, how large is the market, and what kind of investors dominate it. I know, Sojin, you have prepared some slides. Um, maybe they are useful to to describe uh, what are the, the you know the the asset classes and how big they are. So. We, we see your screen, please. You, can, you, can you share your comments? Absolutely. I would be happy to. Thank you very much. Um, so for this question, I've prepared four slides um, that I'll be going over. The first two a little bit more on the market and the second two a little bit more about the investors in the space and um, kind of their influence in the decision making process. So this first chart um, on the left, you'll see the seven different ESG fund tags that we've been tracking. Um, these are ESG integration, climate impact, Article 8 and 9, um, as I'm sure a lot of you have been um, having conversations about the SFDR over the past year or so. Uh, Sharia compliance, a little bit more common in the Middle Eastern region, um, and SDG, so the Sustainable Development Goal Funds. Um, the blue bars are representative of the number of funds in market, and then the pink dots are aggregate fund size. So for something like the impact space, we're seeing that there are quite a few funds in market. Um, this is probably the most, um, if you can say, popular fund label. Um, however, the uh, pink dot is uh, a little bit lower in the bar, so you're seeing a lot of smaller managers, very niche strategies, typically targeting something very specific that's value oriented for their own firm or organization. Um, for something like ESG and Article 8, um, you're seeing fewer funds that are very, very large. So you're seeing a lot of the larger managers uh, raising multi-billion dollar funds for these strategies. Um, and we've seen a little bit of crossover between some of these labels. For example, um, Article 8 and ESG are typically used fairly synonymously, similar with uh, Article 9 and impact, um, as we'll touch upon in some of the, the regulatory conversation for uh, later in this uh, discussion. There are uh, regulatory bodies such as the FCA and the SEC that are heavily focused on how we're identifying and using uh, sustainable related fund denominations uh, for these funds and they're being very, very strict on that. So um, I think it can provide one, a lot of clarity in the space. We definitely support uh, the intervention of regulators. Um, however, it, it does put a lot of pressure on organizations to keep up with this reporting. Um, on the right, uh, just quickly, uh, it goes over some of the different uh, strategies and asset classes where these, asset, uh, where these um, ESG labels are dispersed. So of course, PE, um, also just due to the nature of the size of the asset class, PE is a predominant majority of um, the private market space. So unsurprisingly, we're seeing buy own growth um, kind of dominate. And um, back to some of the sentiments that Claire mentioned, some of the larger sections here, infrastructure and real estate. However, we do see representation across all asset classes. So uh, we're not really seeing anyone um, in isolation for uh, being discounted from this type of fundraising. 
Um, the next looks at um, the chart on the left, so all of those labels, what fundraising has looked like over the past 10 or so years. Um, again, it's really gotten a lot of attention since the COVID times, but you see um, a lot of firms, BNP is probably in here, um, with some labels of um, ESG involvement from early stages. So we still do see larger managers, typically ones that um, are of the, the highest tier for AUM because they do have access and exposure to different financial sectors that may have given them that experience um, to know how to label um, ESG related funds in private markets. Um, but since the pandemic, we've seen a lot more activity from first time fund managers and those who are new to the sustainable investment space. Um, a little bit of slowdown in 2022, just due to the macro environment. I think a lot of um, investors are kind of holding on to capital and waiting until um, the asset valuations get a little bit lower, less competitive. Um, but in 2023, this is just year to date figures as of um, the beginning of May. So we're already seeing quite a strong year that um, is already beating out um, last year's figures. So we anticipate that this will continue going into H2, especially as there are some uh, new rulings from different regulatory bodies that will roll out. So that activity is very likely to continue over time. In terms of which investors are active in the market, um, these are our number of firms with ESG mandates. So in th this means investors have come to us and said over the next 12 months. So they also have their general kind of investment uh, allocation strategy on Prequin, but these, this is signaling over the next year, we have an intention of investing in ESG. Um, you see a lot of insurance companies and family offices, wealth managers, um, typically uh, at the top of these mandates. Um, family offices, very unsurprising. They get a little bit more flexibility in terms of their allocation mandates. Um, so I think especially in a market downturn where we're seeing things like denominator effects come into play, um, it's really nice to have that flexibility that allows them to align their investments a little bit more with their values. Um, and less to like specific um, allocation percentages that may uh, end up for other investors liquidating some investments that um, could be value oriented. The last one that I'll note here that I think is fairly interesting is um, we've seen um, public and private pension funds be fairly active in um, ESG investing as well. Um, I will um, not dive too deep into this, but uh, now that I'm based in London, uh, I'm able to see a little bit more of the US ESG landscape from a, a third party now, and uh, it is very, very political. And um, typically when there is um, a democratic president in office, um, there is a lot of conversation around what a fiduciary duty is and whether or not that includes ESG. Um, with a, a democratic president in office, we're seeing a little bit more flexibility of saying ESG is included. When there is a Republican president, the trends typically go the other way. So we're seeing a lot of activity in ESG for from pensions now. However, we do have an election year coming up next year, and um, we are very interested to see how that might affect um, pensions involvement with sustainable investing. Um, the last slide on this is um, every single year we do a survey for all of our investors uh, globally across all investor types, all regions, um, all strategies. And um, the two uh, I think most interesting questions for this conversation are um, how much is ESG important when you're making it an investment decision? Um, and a majority of the responses at least fit into the average considerable or extreme. So those top three, um, you were not really seeing a lot of um, responses that say absolutely no importance. Um, it's quickly very gone from a nice to have conversation to this is a focal point that we're having during all of our uh, road shows when we're speaking with investors, we need to have this kind of data prepared. Otherwise, it's not really a welcome conversation. So um, very quickly seeing that as a must have on the agenda. Um, and then the second chart, which um, I think really uh, illustrates how much of an influence ESG has um, for investors is, would you turn down um, an otherwise attractive investment opportunity or partner due to concerns over ESG standards? 43.3, um, so the major, uh, majority of these respondents has 
have said, yes, we would do so. Um, and notably, 28.9% of these respondents actually have said, yes, we have done so. So um, due to ESG concerns, you may lose out on an investment opportunity, um, really show, showcasing that um, investors know the, the power of their decisions and the power of data and uh, you know what these regulators are likely to ask of them over the next um, next reporting cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Sojin. Clearly a very, very interesting feature you've been drawing for us here. Um, there was one slide that was showing, you know, by, by category of investors, uh, who were the investors who were going to, you know, to take an ESG mandate with private assets. And I saw banks and wealth managers are in the, in the top 10. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts about that, uh, Claire. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and we see also in that slide that the, in the top three, you have the family offices. And we, we see that also among our clients because family offices have sometimes, as the institutional investors have, an allocation to ESG products uh, in their uh, wealth uh, management. Um, if we speak about private clients and ultra networks clients, clearly ESG considerations are more and more taken into account in their investment decisions uh, and we see also an increasing interest from the youngest generations for which it becomes compulsory to have uh, ESG compliant and impactful uh, investments so I believe that the, the, the offering of the bank of the banks will be driven also by, by of course uh, the, the clients uh, demand which is increasing and um, in terms of experience regarding impact funds, for example, we see a very binary position from our clients as of today, uh, and certainly it will change. But for some clients, it's a top priority. And these clients are generally um, well-informed um, investors on, on this subject. Um, they also work to have a positive uh, impact in other areas their own business, their own consumption, their philanthropic uh, projects, uh, and they often have an ESG investment portfolios. But for other clients, um, in fact, they, 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 they tell us that they prefer to continue to invest in traditional private equity funds, for example, and with the profits, uh, they will allocate uh, the money uh, to um, the charities or philanthropic projects they will choose. So, so we still have uh, two, two, two ways of thinking. Um, in Europe, thanks to the MIFI II regulation, uh, the industry, uh, the, the bank industry is now structured to provide answers to clients' ESG preferences, because now we ask our clients what their ESG preferences and their ESG profile is. Uh, and I believe that uh, we have a, an important role uh, as distributors in evaluating sustainable investments for the products we propose to our clients, uh, as they are not uh, strictly standardized uh, today. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, looking at the, at the tool, uh, the tool, the question Q and A tool, we have received uh, a question about you know the preferences across geographies. If you see any difference from you know the North America, uh, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, um, I know both of you have a global perspective. So maybe we can start with Sojin to hear what what she has seen, and then go back to Claire because she. Claire, your bank is a global bank, so you also have this feedback. Maybe we start with, with Sojin? Sure. So I would say, um, actually, if, if you don't mind, um, I might show one of my slides for this. I was going to save it for the next question, but I think it's very relevant here. Um, when we're looking at disclosures across um, the different regions for um, ESG, and uh, just as a, a quick side note, um, these are across 37 indicators that we've sourced from the PRI, ILPA, SASB, TCFD questionnaires. Um, so typically the most common ones that are found in the industry right now. Um, we're seeing that uh, Australasia and Europe are very well positioned to uh, satisfy some of this reporting. And we're seeing a lot of activity when it comes to um, 
ESG investing in these two regions. Um, Europe is always typically coined the front runner of ESG, and I think that's because um, a lot of the regulatory bodies, you're thinking SFDR, EU taxonomy, the EU commission, um, and, and just uh, many, many more. Um, and that's not including uh, region specific, like the Nordic countries, which are very focused on governance, so on and so forth. So uh, you see a lot of these uh, regional, but also kind of larger uh, body territorial um, reporting standards that are very, very normal in, in these sectors. So ESG investing tends to do very well here. Um, whereas in uh, North America, again, this is the, the largest global economy. So um, I think just due to sheer size of you know, where that market is, you don't see as much activity. Um, but again, a larger denominator, so unsurprising there. Um, and then uh, I will say for Australasia, um, I believe their regulatory body is called um, ASIC, um, but they actually have um, a, a watchdog that has um, really, really focused on whether or not ESG fundraising can meet some of the standards that um, are written out in their marketing materials and their PPMs. And uh, there was a, an article recently saying that um, the, the watchdog has actually removed some of the labels and been involved with uh, 35 different cases for um, potential greenwashing. So um, I would say the, the two areas where regulation is the highest is also typically where uh, we see ESG investment really able to thrive. Thank you, thank you, uh, Sojin. Maybe Claire, would, would you like to share your client's appetite by, by reading? Yeah, yeah, so I will speak for mainly for Europe Asia because uh, we, we don't have US clients. So clearly um, in Europe, our clients are um, more and more aware of uh, these uh, ESG uh, topics. And, and we see, as I say, more, more and more demand and the regulation helps also. So, uh, there is an ecosystem, uh, I would say, um, which helped. But, but for example, I was in Asia two weeks ago to to to, to visit our our team and, and meet some clients, and and there is also uh, uh, more and more uh, demand, um, maybe more from the the next generation, uh, but um, uh, and there is a strong interest for for philanthropy also. Uh, in Asia, so so we I believe it's it's a global uh, trend and and global uh, evolution. Where we see more differences between the generations of our clients, um, the youngest uh, clients are mainly focused on climate change uh, mitigation, um, and their parents. <laughs> are more uh, maybe focused on social issues, poverty, uh, and also gender diversity uh, and governance issues. So, so, so this is a, the, 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 maybe the main difference we, we, we could see. Thank you, thank you very much. And yeah, I believe of course, it's like a, there's a huge divide and you know, you know younger generation have really feel this threat of climate change, whereas uh, the older generations, they, they were more inclined to uh, human rights, social issues, poverty, and, and of course, these topics are, are still high in their, in, their value, in their value set. Okay, thank you for, for your comments. Now we can go uh, to um, the third topic that is uh, more about the methodology and data, the issues um, you, you find as an investor. And um, and uh, you know to to uh, to circle back with the topic of climate change, uh, we have also had a question from the audience about uh, net zero. So you know this is also a very a very important topic. And I know Claire, you have devised a, a model a structure that is very uh, very comprehensive and very solid to to assess ESG and, and private assets. Maybe I, I think it's really worth to share it with with the audience. Yeah, so, so that's true. BNP Paribas Wealth Management has decided to develop a sustainable rating for its various financial offerings to help clients to compare the level of sustainability of the different investments offered by the, by the bank. And due to the high specificity of the private assets funds, 
the existing um, sustainability rating methodology for listed products such as bonds, equities, uh, mutual funds, or, or, or ETF were not applicable. So we have decided to develop a dedicated uh, methodology uh, for, for private assets funds after having interviewed uh, during one year uh, many private asset managers, the head of ESG, the funds manager, uh, having analyzed the guidelines uh, of uh, the different uh, professional associations uh, such as uh, Invest Europe or, or France Invest. Um, after, of course, uh, having analyzed uh, all the, the regulations. And so this methodology consists in scoring the fund with clovers from zero to 10. Funds classified as impact funds uh, get a scoring of nine to 10 clovers. Uh, and our methodology uh, has been reviewed by an external auditor. And consequently, when we select a fund, a private assets fund, we do a deep due diligence uh, with the joint skills of my private assets team and our Wealth Management Sustainability Center, because we need their expertise. And uh, we have access now systematically to an ESG um, DDQ, which is also quite new. And now uh, you, you, in each data room, you, you have an ESG DDQ. We analyze it, we interview the ESG team uh, and also the, the funds manager. And part of our questions relate to the, yes, the management company, to the, to the GP. Um, do they have an ESG policy? Have they signed the PRI? Uh, what is, we assess the ESG team. Uh, we look at the reporting, et cetera. And part of the question concerns the asset level during uh, the investment process. Huh? So at the beginning, during the due diligence process, during the holding period of the company, and then uh, at the uh, exit. And so for we look at each KPI regarding E, S, and G. Um, and based on the answers, we, we fulfill a, a questionnaire and we, we score uh, each, uh, each answer. So it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative um, assessment. Uh, and this scoring, and of course, we disclose this scoring to, to, to the clients. And this scoring enables our clients to benchmark a specific fund and to be aware of its level of sustainability. So uh, it, it's a real added value uh, highlighted by, by our clients. And I believe that thanks to this ESG uh, deep due diligence we, we do, uh, and of course with the other LPs, um, we, we contribute to help the private equity firms to enhance their process and to demonstrate the importance of the ESG integration for, for their investors. And um, we have the feeling that the, the GPs, the asset managers, are today more focused on uh, their investment process. Uh, and now I believe they need to be more focused on uh, the ESG integration in their management company. Thank you. Well, this is, of course, a very, very helpful insight. And uh, maybe with Sojin, you, you shared a little bit uh, uh, some comments on on disclosure, but I know you have also um, such, some more insights with regards to uh, methodology. Uh, would you like to share your insights with us? I'd love to. Thank you. Um, so going back to those thirty seven indicators, we what we've illustrated here is what that dispersion looks like across asset classes. Um, for any of those in the audience who are unfamiliar with box and whisker plots, um, what we're looking at here are uh, the lower line, which is the min, uh, the max, uh, the first quartile, third quartile, um, and the medians and averages of all of these disclosures. So if you look at the axes, um, really the, the averages and medians are um, under 20 or under 10%. We have a couple outliers here with infrastructure and natural resources. Again, just touching upon what we have spoken about earlier with natural alignment with some of these asset classes. Um, However, what we're seeing with some of the dots here are there are some outliers. Um, what we usually find with some of the firms that are um, very, very high in their disclosure against uh, very normal ESG um, 
uh, questionnaires and frameworks is that these tend to be much larger firms. Um, so again, also touching upon that idea of resourcing really is golden here. Um, a lot of the larger firms um, and especially asset classes like uh, PE, infrastructure, real estate that um, might have a little bit more of an advantage in terms of um, being able to get access to certain resourcing that uh, asset classes like venture capital may not have access to. Um, we're seeing still some front runners that um, are really meeting a lot of these criteria. And uh, I think that's where we're seeing a lot of advantages come into play for those who come into the room already having prepared a lot of reporting um, and really just being able to solidify what does that reporting and risk look like over a three, five, 10 year horizon. Because again, for private markets, um, we see those longer term investment horizons, which uh, very naturally aligns with ESG as well. So um, just a lot of synergies here. I'll skip over this slide as it's something that we just reviewed. Um, and what we're seeing here, um, again, on some of the methodology and data challenges, as we get a little bit deeper into an investment, um, a lot of them are finding reporting very, very challenging. So even at firm transparency, some of the highest percentages are still about 18%, 9% uh, or 14%, depending on which territory you're looking at. Um, and once you look at the pink bars, which is asset level transparency, um, this really drops off. Um, you're seeing 2% and 3%. Um, in, in large markets and also globally. And what this represents is at the firm level, you're getting a lot of things like governance or um, any of their diversity metrics. Um, however, on the asset level, you're asking at the portfolio company, are you able to get GHG emissions from your portfolio companies? Are you able to get diversity metrics from your portfolio companies? And uh, the answer is a pretty resounding no at the time. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, but when it comes to um, the asset level and things like supply chain um, and, and how we define a lot of these metrics, especially when it comes to emissions, it's a, a really big question mark. Um, and especially since we are talking about emissions, I, I do want to get to um, one of the panel's questions that you mentioned about net zero. Um, Emissions is a really difficult territory um, in terms of scope one and two. Those are already hard enough to track um, depending on revenue or employees. There are a large uh, amount of methodologies that you can use to even calculate that. When it comes to scope three, that just becomes a, a whole playing field where uh, you can include things like supply chain, any of your vendors, um, your electronic usage, um, and whether or not you choose uh, it to be material in your scope three or not can differ from your peers. So um, it becomes a really, really um, incomparable uh, market when you're trying to decipher what these mean. Um, and because of those reasons, we're actually seeing a lot of firms either uh, self choose to leave organizations such as the net zero affiliation. So net zero asset managers, net zero banks, there's also climate action 100. Um, there's SBTI validations, um, a lot going on for carbon emissions. But unfortunately, we've seen we've started to see um, uh, divergence away from those types of affiliations and organizations where um, if a firm does not choose to leave on their own merit, uh, we've actually seen um, some calls through some steering committees and boards asking for certain firms to leave if they can't fulfill this criteria. So methodolo methodological uh, changes is um, one of the, the hardest challenges in today's market um, by far. Thank you. Thank you, Sojin. Maybe to wrap up this, this um, topic of methodology, uh, you touched about, um, uh, you know, emissions. Uh, Claire explained that uh, her model, the model of BMP Paribas, is an holistic model taking into account many different elements. Um, is uh, ju just to maybe if you want to, um, Claire, if you feel like you want to say something about energy and fossil, fossil fuels, how do you look at them? Do you take them in the overall holistic? Um, when you when you design your investment uh, analysis for uh, and due diligence for ESG uh, energy and, and fossil fuels they are how do you look at it is a uh, is there a, a rule of thumb or it's more global because yeah yeah of course of, of course it, it is taken into account in our holistic uh, uh, analysis and it, it's part of our question we investigate yeah, uh, yeah for, for, for sure I suppose you have a view of energy transition, right? So, you know, the model is we need to phase out energy little by little, being mindful of a just transition as well. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and this is a, again a, a demand for, from the clients. Uh, they really to want to, to, to invest in a energy transition, renewable energy. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's why infrastructure funds are well positioned to address this demand. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's really uh, enjoyable to see how, how much interaction we get with our audience and thanks for, for the questions. Um, maybe uh, in terms of timing, because we have 10 minutes left and we want to cover two more topics, uh, maybe let's go a little bit on the fuel, on the future growth opportunities. And I know, Sergin, you have some, some indications there. Yes, um, I... These next two questions, I will breeze through them a little bit quicker for uh, time's sake. Um, so the uh, two charts here are on our LP investor surveys. Um, the left just being about um, what are the main drivers for ESG um, investments and uh, decision making. Um, and the top answer there is a proven link between ESG and financial performance, so performance tends to be top of mind. The second being the regulatory and legal requirements, which will lead us uh, nicely into our next question. Um, when asked about uh, where they think ESG funds perform, most investors think ESG-focused funds tend to perform the same, which um, actually is a, a very good sign, um, with about 27.9 um, saying that ESG-focused funds tend to perform better because um, there have been a, a lot of conversation around um, where do these funds perform in comparison to their non-ESG peers? Um, and uh, many of the, uh, what we would call like non-ESG believers would say that they perform worse. So um, there are a lot of studies out currently. Um, this actually is special to our Candrium audience. It's um, performance data that we started putting together for the sake of uh, this panel today, looking at um, all of the ESG funds that are in a benchmark. So these are not just funds that have performance data, but ones that are in a benchmark, meaning they're three years past vintage, they have net IRR and uh, net multiple reported to us. So when you look at the dispersion across which asset classes those are in and which quartiles they are in, again, a majority in two and three. Um, but if you look at the axes, it's really not that many funds. Um, we're seeing a lot of our funds in the 2021, 2022, 2023 vintage. Um, so will be a little bit of a waiting game before we see um, those funds start to mature and uh, really a healthy amount of, uh, of performance metrics so that we can build a robust benchmark around that. So um, excited to see that data over time, but um, it's a little bit early stage for us still in that uh, in the performance arena at least. Yeah. Thank you, Sojin. Claire, we, we have seen a lot of things in this uh, last couple of charts and it's about you know performance and ESG. Uh, the, the conviction of some clients about, you know, the potential of ESG to, to outperform. So what is your point of view here? Uh, how do you yeah. see it? No, it's a very important question because uh, many clients are still uh, skeptical uh, about the, the, the performance of uh, ESG uh, funds or impact funds. And I, I strongly believe that ESG management has a positive impact on the value creation uh, and, and contributes more and more to maximize the value of a company uh, at the exit. Of course, it's a little bit re too recent for, for the private equity firms to demonstrate that because they, many of them are, have not yet sold the, the companies. Uh, but, but I'm convinced that companies having poor ESG performance will struggle to find uh, buyers in, in the coming uh, years. So um, uh, I believe that adopting a strong ESG policy will lead to better long-term returns. And we, we have to convince our clients uh, uh, about that. And, and even for impact fund, we, we could expect an outperformance uh, on their generalist peers. So, Financial returns matter to our clients, but more and more the way these returns are generated also uh, matters. Uh, and investors, I believe, are increasingly aware that uh, with uh, an ESG or impact investment, uh, there could be no trade-off uh, on the financial returns. So this is our challenge to, to, to demonstrate that. Thank you, thank you, Claire. And uh, and I think this ties back with you know uh, training information, how you train your your bankers, and and if if needed, how you train, how to to explain. 
the link between ESG and uh, and performance to your clients as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the training is crucial. And we, we, we see that uh, everyone is lost. As I say, the definitions vary from time to time, from country to another country, from an organization to another. So, and the, the, we see also that the regulations should be clarified. So, uh, training the staff on sustainability is an important issue for, for, for BNP Paribas. And we created, for example, a sustainability academy for this person. Purpose, uh, as you as you did, uh, but with a stream dedicated to our private bankers. Uh, some trainings are also compulsory for all the staff uh, regarding the AG uh, regulation. Uh, we have also some specific initiatives, uh, such as, for example, the climate fresk, uh, which is proposed to uh, each uh, each employee. Uh, we have short videos. Um, co-design with our private bankers to help them to answer the client's questions. So training uh, in each organization is essential. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Maybe for the sake of concluding the, the seminar, the webinar on time, I would suggest we go to the last topic and this is about regulation. And uh, I know, Sojin, you've been doing some work on that. So I'll hand the, hand the floor to you. Thank you. So uh, I think for sake of time, this is just the one slide that I'll share with the group because um, a lot of people may have probably been seeing in the news, um, both the SEC and SFDR. So just a couple of quick updates. What does that mean? Um, the SEC um, has been working on two primary uh, new rulings, one about fund naming and the second about climate related disclosures. Uh, Gary Gensler, the current SEC chair is a very big fan of ESG, which is great for us. Um, so a lot of people thought that that would roll out in April of this year. Um, however, it's been pushed back to H2. Um, a, a lot of uh, kind of word in the news has been around the fact that this is probably because they're preparing for a heavy legal battle. Um, we can't forget that when you're talking about ESG implementation at the firm level, uh, usually the first teams that this reaches is compliance and the legal team. Um, so if you can't convince that team, it's very, very hard to start that conversation. Um, so they're gearing up to, for what could be a, a very, um, uh, contentious uh, legal battle in, in the latter part of this year. The second is the SFDR. Um, a lot of people have heard about Article 8 and 9 funds, um, but recently um, there have been uh, a little bit more uh, clarity on what Article 9 reporting means. Um, as long as they fulfill the, the three tests of uh, contributing to an environmental and social objective, that being the do no significant harm or DNSH as many people may have seen, um, meeting good governance practices and then just making sure that they have a really clear um, kind of central focal point for their fundraising um, will be um, really, really important for our landscape. So um, there are also some uh, regulators like the FCA and um, a couple others that have notably said that they're going to start um, cracking down on ESG ratings providers. It doesn't really touch Prequin since we don't have a ratings product, um, but I know that is also very top of mind for um, a lot in the investment space. Um, so those are kind of the, the major influences that uh, we're seeing today. Again, a lot of, around uh, carbon and uh, the E part of ESG and um, some around diversity and governance metrics, especially as uh, international politics uh, becomes a little bit more contentious, but lots of activity to be done this year very excited to see that thank you thank you Sojin. and maybe uh claire i will go back to you uh of course regulation is very important for banks and uh and uh you know mifi dsg you mentioned this a little bit before uh happy to hear your final thoughts yeah, no, I, I confirm that the regulation uh, uh, was beneficial and is beneficial and and, and pushed the asset managers to adapt uh, which is great, but uh, and it contributes also to the detailed communication on KPIs that we can convey to, to our clients on carbon emissions and the diversity metrics, for example. Uh, but it could be great uh, one day to have a clear framework of KPIs to monitor, of threshold to achieve, uh, of course, depending on the company size and sectors of activity. So I don't know if the regulator we could help and, and could uh, one day um, define clearly uh, these uh, KPIs because today there is no clear universal uh, market uh, metrics 
uh, enabling the investor to compare the, the funds. So a level of standardization will be essential. Um, and uh, it's crucial to have robust data and to be able, of course, to, to process them in a rigorous way. So this is still a, a big challenge and certainly the, the regulation will, uh, will help. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, for your comments on, on regulation. I think we have come to, uh, to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you, both of you, for your participation and preparation. I also want to thank uh, the audience for their interactions. And uh, maybe just would like to remember uh, that um, our Candium Academy has a new ESG talk in September. It will be dedicated to engagement. I know some people were asking questions about engagement uh, today. So hopefully we can answer them in, in, a, in a few uh, few months. I would also like to uh, remind everyone that there will be a replay of this, uh, of this webinar on our platform where you can also find all of the previous ESG uh, talks. And in concluding, I would like to, uh, to remind everyone that at Cambrium we invest for tomorrow. Thank you and uh, have, a, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.